How to become more persuasive. How each of you can become more persuasive. So today, we're going to talk about systematizing. It's not about you. It's about them. How to put this to work. Over and over we've said, it's not about you. It's about them. So how do you do it? So today we're going to talk about why it is so important for you to treat different people differently. Because it's not about you. When you accomplish this, you are going to feel like you are in control. When you feel you're in control, you're going to develop better relationships. When you develop better relationships, what happens, Mr. Stallwood? You, get more money you, you make more money. So let's talk about, let's expand on this whole concept of how do we determine needs. How can we understand what's going on in the mind of, of buyers? So today we're going to go over several different areas that help you now begin to get a better idea of what the buyer is thinking. So we're going to develop a customer strategy. You develop the relationship strategy. And now we're going to develop a customer strategy. So, first of all, a customer strategy is a plan that you put together that enables you to understand the buyer's perspective. What's in the mind of the buyer. When you understand what's in the mind of the buyer, you create more satisfaction from him or her and you increase their responsiveness to your offer. Why is this important? Because it takes five times as much energy and resources to sell a new buyer than it does to resell an existing buyer. So you've got to figure out how to create a relationship with an existing buyer and then how to leverage that because they will take you to your buyers in the future. Now, now one of the things that's going to be essential to you as you go into the work portal is this idea that is now crossed all across the world. And that is everything that's in your head you've got to put inside your customer relationship management system. What's the benefit to you? So when you're out and you've got a meeting with Bob Smith and you're, you've got five minutes before the meeting and you pull out your phone into your, you have your user ID password into your CRM system that's up on the cloud and you click Bob Smith, boom. You go hit LinkedIn, you hit your CRM that's got all the specific information on the other calls you've made. All the information about the products and services he's purchased from you. It's all here. But you have to put it in. So all you low C's who go, Brr. sorry guys, this needs to be, Siri needs to become your second best girlfriend. She said put everything in CRM, but I know in the book it's saying you don't put your personal opinions. It's just the facts. Right. Thank you, Mr. Harshbark. That's a very, very dull. Yes. Well, he's made the presentation better. He wasn't afraid to say, wait a minute. And he's right. Thank you. You put into the CRM everything about the buyer. Why don't you put your opinions? Because the next person that comes in might be swayed by your opinion. See, people can have different opinions, but they can't have different facts. But isn't CRM a personalized? Is CRM a personalized issue? No. This in the number one vendor in CRM systems is called Salesforce.com. 
lots and lots of big companies are using Salesforce. So they apply the Salesforce system and they customize it to each, each organization. So if you're selling for, I don't know if Fast Small uses Salesforce, I'll bet they do. So if you're selling for Fast Small, then you're going to get into your little component. You have this little piece on the CRM that's all the information about your customers and their orders. And you have access to that, but another salesperson over here might not have access to it. It's all controlled inside the program. So it's essential for you to deposit the relevant facts, not the opinions, in the CRM system. Now, who's the customer today? <laughs> when I was in sales, and we had meetings to determine who our customer was, and we brainstorm who was our customer, and it was this generic customer that we were trying to understand. It's over. What's important is the person you are calling on. How can you get in the mind of that person? Because as we talked about last time, you have got to customize every presentation so it meets the needs of the buyer, of the person you're in front of. Why? Because you're trying to persuade that person. Dale Carnegie said it best. He said, people do things for their reasons, not yours. So find their reasons. <coughs> There's still up to 30 extra credit points that's available by simply reading his great book, doing a one-page paper, and spending 30 minutes with me. Treat different customers differently. So we've grown up believing in the golden rule. Treat others as you would like to be treated. Not in sales. Platinum rule. Treat others as they want to be treated. When we talk about needs, and how many of you are working retail? Okay, so Mr. Upton, when someone comes in, you're working at Nats. Nats. He's working at Nats. When someone comes into Nats, are they just kind of driving down the street and their car kind of automatically turns in and they come in and they go, oh, I'm just looking around. No. They come in with a need. And that need is realized. Now, if you respond to that realized need, then they are going to buy something that they thought they wanted to buy. But what you've missed is the unrealized need that's there. They came in to buy a kayak. And when you, when you uncover that they're going to Alaska, it uncovers a whole realm of needs that you may understand, but they don't. Today, products are out. The customer is in. Customers care less and less about products. Because products are there to meet their realized and unrealized needs. So is it, do people, are they interested in Corvettes? Well, some would say, yeah, I love a Corvette. Well, how about a Lamborghini? How about a Ferrari? How about an Aston Martin? Lots of cool sports cars. But it becomes relevant when the Corvette meets your needs. And that's when you smile at a red Corvette. How many of you have automobile insurance? Any of you have renter's insurance? Any of you, if you have your insurance with State Farm? Say you have State Farm. So, Mr. Bailey, why do you like State Farm? I don't have a great answer for that. <laughs> 
<laughs> You've always had State Farm. They're a great neighbor. Uh, not entirely true. I've not always had State Farm. I've had it for the past four or five years. So when your premium goes out every month, that pays for your automobile? Two cars and renters and, and life insurance. And life insurance. Okay. How's it feel when that check leaves your checking account? Not amazing. And what do you get for it? Hey. Peace of mind. Ah, uh, peace of mind, right? So when does State Farm become important? Irma. Yeah. Irma. Harvey. Then all those payments you've been making matter. So it's not about the product or service, it's what you get as a response. We talked about Tom James last time. Tom James sells suits. You may say, Mr. Lawson, yeah, that's 1250 bucks. I can't afford that unless the occasion warrants it, unless you're James Bond. And you always want to get the girl that you're going to make sure you dress for success. So it's much less about the product than the satisfaction and happiness of the client. Now the old experts used to be the salespeople that showed up. They had all the information about the product. And they brought out the vacuum cleaner. They dumped some dirt on the floor on the brand new carpet. Your mother shrieked, oh my God, and the salesperson showed them how all the dirt was picked up and then went over to another area of the carpet where they had not put dirt and they vacuumed over here and they found there's dirt over there that was in the carpet that was cleaned by a previous vacuum cleaner. In this marketplace, the buyer had all, the, the seller had all the information. Today, Buyers have the information, and buyers have the advantage. You have the advantage. You cannot make the assumption today that you have all the information you need to make the sale. If you make that assumption, you're going to be in the bottom 80%. You must assume you don't have enough information about the buyer. That's why we're going to look at so many ways for you to uncover what's going on inside of the mind of the buyer. Now let's differentiate for a couple minutes between B2C, business to consumer, and business to business. Because you are going to look at different offers as you go through the interviewing process between now and your summer internship, between your internship and getting your final job. Lots of different areas. So let's examine both. Business to consumer first. Now in business to consumer, people and organizations are selling products and services to individuals, couples, and families, which they consume. Easy. Here are some possible brands. Brands are critical in B2C. Because once, because a, a company has spent millions of dollars in advertising so that when you look at that product, you already have an impression. You can see here, all the different brands that are available. If you look at Procter & Gamble, Tide and Pampers and Gillette, over and over. When you look at Nestle across the world, when you look at Kellogg's, and you have your Cheeto, your, your Cheez-Its, or you have your sugar frosted flakes. So this is a habitual buy, and there's not much involvement, now listen in, there's not much of involvement in your mind when you make a habitual buy. That's why they spend so much money on brands. Now, if a person becomes interested in another product, again, how much is the involvement? Well, not much. Except that if you're going to make a switch, you tend to look at brands when you make a switch. 
I'll step back a second. Reflect on this for you as a future salesperson. Should you go to work for a company that has a solid brand or that doesn't have a solid brand? If you go to work for a company that has a solid brand, the commissions that you earn will be less. Because they've already paid all the money. So when you walk in and you say, I'm with Kellogg's, I'm the new Kellogg salesperson, the store manager goes, oh sure, go to the cereal department and tell me what we need to do. But if you're selling Kashi, although Kashi's a kind of a brand now, if you're selling the new no, no, and that fruit looks good, that's bread. So if I say it's it's malted meal shredded wheat. I just made that up. It's harder for you to get in. Number two, who's going to train you? A company with a brand will invest in you. Companies that don't have brands are going to pay you a higher commission, but you're going to have to go out and do it on your own. They're not going to invest as much money in you. Next. Where people spend a lot of time in B2C is on complex decisions. Now, on complex decisions, you've got to <laughs> lean in and listen. Those involve products that have high prices. Those involve products in which there's infrequent demand, or, or there's infrequency between the times that you buy. And last, when there's self-expression, if someone's going to buy, if a woman's going to buy cosmetics or jewelry, there's an opportunity for a consultative buyer, for a consultative salesperson. Now let's talk about B2B, B2B business to business. So I just want to clarify, did you say you want to work for a business that has a brand or one that doesn't? I didn't tell. I didn't say. Okay. I just gave you options. If it were me in your spot, I would want to go to work for a company that would train me early on. So I would tend to go to work for a branded company. But you know, you're going to talk to your best friend back home, and his dad just started up a business, and they need a salesman, and they're looking for one, and you're taking a sales class, and they would like to hire you because they need a salesman. Be careful. They're not going to train you. And if you don't start selling stuff in the first couple weeks, they're going to say it's not working and you need to go someplace else. And that just got deposited on your resume. Be careful. Business to business. So these are people and organizations who are selling products and services to other people and organizations. <coughs> you will not have heard of a lot of these companies. Why? Because you're a B2C buyer. But the world, the, but business, improves to the extent to which these B2B salespeople are out there doing two important things. One, reducing costs. Or increasing revenues. These are the two things that B2B buyers are looking for. So don't think that they love your product from Facetol, a great B2B supplier. You don't fall in love with the products, you fall in love with the extent to which they can help your business buyers increase their revenues or reduce their costs. Now Facenol is one of our sponsors, great company, their niche is they put in industrial vending machines inside companies. And as a salesperson, you're out there trying to figure out what consumables they consume. Is it nuts and bolts, safety equipment, whatever you have to offer that you can put in these vending machines. Then if somebody needs it in the plant, they just go up to the vending machine, they put their card in, identifies them, they open the door, that identifies the product, they pull the product out, you get a commission. But you've got to get these vending machines in lots of these companies. Growing like the Dickens. Next, Gartner. Now, Gartner is here today. 
and tomorrow and Wednesday. They have 200 summer internships that they would like to interview you for. Now, they're not going to interview face-to-face -face because this position is a telephone position. So all people at Gartner, when they start, they start on the telephone. And so you're going to be interviewed that way. But you should meet some people here tomorrow, today, tomorrow, and the next day to discuss when you can have an interview. Qualtrics. Qualtrics is a company I met at the National Collegiate Sales Competition. If you look at the research that's being done by nearly every Western professor, when surveys are a part of their research, Qualtrics is the vendor. Now Qualtrics is moving from educational, from an educational focus to business to business. Lennox is another NCSC vendor, and we must have five or six former students who are working at selling for Lennox. Lennox produces, they manufacture heating and air conditioning equipment, and that's sold to the mom and pop owners of HVAC dealers in cities and communities all over the United States. B2B. Next, CED. Anyone worked at CED? Consolidated Electrical Distributors. They sell lighting equipment, B2B. So the whole movement today is going away from incandescent and fluorescent toward LEDs. And they're one of the leaders. So B2B, selling from businesses to other businesses. Now what is a buying center, Mr. Farmer? your text. One of my questions. <laughs> what is a buying center? This is B2B. Um, it's cross-functional. Oh, it's a bunch of different departments working together to, I guess. Influence the buying yeah. So it's a, a lot of different people in the organization who are, who are going to weigh in on the decision as to whether or not you sell your products, B2B. So this could be the president, could be the VP of finance, could be the sales manager, could be the logistics person. All these people need, because they are going to be involved in the purchasing decision or they are going to use it, are going to be involved in the decision. What does a B2B salesperson then have to do, Ms. Baldwin? Given. All these people. What do you have to do? They have to make sure that they're talking to the right person. Isn't that like the gatekeepers and the influencers? And all the that? gatekeeper could be one of these people. Film? Um, <laughs> would you say. Why would the gatekeeper be one of the key people? Because they can't make the decision. They can only... Why would the gatekeeper the be an important person in the organization? Because when you walk in, if you don't build a relationship with the gatekeeper, she'll say, he's out. He's on vacation. No, listen. They don't need what you've got. They've got thousands of people that do that. You don't get past the front door. Another comment on Gatekeeper, when I did the sales um, shadowing, um, I was doing calls with a salesperson who like calls on <laughs> dentistry stuff. And so every single person, every single time, the Gatekeeper is the one that controls all these like, finances and like whether they wish to talk to the doctor or not. So the Gatekeeper is essential. So you're going to learn how to put the Gatekeeper's name in your CRM, where it's going to be, mostly it's going to be a she. And chances are she's going to be a high S to probably a high I. Because she's called the beginningist. She's the first person everybody meets, and they want everyone to have a good first impression. So they'll put someone who's kind and nice and doesn't like change and likes dealing with people that she knows, and you walk in and she doesn't know you. You will never know it, Mr. Lawson, because she'll say, good morning. 
Welcome to ABC Manufacturing. How can I help you? Like, oh, what a wonderful person. I'm going to make a sale. No. I'd like to speak to Bob Smith. I'm sorry. Bob doesn't have any appointments today. You've got to create a relationship with her. Okay. So the issue with the cross with, with with the buying center is is you have to build a relationship. You've got to same selling model. You've got to build trust with every person in the buying center. Because if you build a relationship with the gatekeeper, when you build it, and you can, so how do you do it? So you find out her name is Barbara Johnson. And you get on, and if you have the app called Handwritten, Handwritten App. So the Handwritten App talks to Salesforce.com. So you say, send, did I say her first name was? Barbara. Bar Barbara Johnson. So you send Barbara Johnson handwritten note number two. And then handwritten note, they have, a, they have printers that write longhand. And they write the thank you note that you, that you designed for receptionists. And you put in a $5 Starbucks card after she has, she, and then you, you customize it, and you say, thanks for introducing me to Bob Smith. And it's handwritten on the card, goes out, the notes, the, the outside of the envelope is handwritten, and she gets it. Wow, you know how many handwritten notes she gets? Zero. Oh, who's this from? Well, who is this? She opens it up. Well, isn't that nice? It has taken you $3 and enough time on the app to make sure it's sent out and a $5 Starbucks card which your company will pay for. So yes, gatekeepers are essential. When you come in next time, you, she says, Mr. Bailey, get in here. You gave me that Starbucks card. How can I help you today? In you go. All right. Now, I need your attention. <laughs> if anyone is asleep at the switch, if you take as your first job a B to C job, there is very little crossover between B to C and B to B. What does that mean? Once you figure out how to sell personal lines insurance and car insurance, how easy is it to cross over to selling business insurance? It's not hard. It's damn hard, and they're not going to hire you. It's a completely different selling model. Now, what I'm going to do today is I'm pushing to help you go to work for a B2B firm. <coughs> That's where the big money is. The top 20 percenters are in B2B firms. Every now and then you run across a Jordan Yoko who's in a B2C firm and he's gone to $400,000 in income. But it's so rare But in B2B because, we're going to talk about that in a minute, about why it's, it's so profitable to work in a B2B firm. But just understand, there's not much crossover. So let's talk about what's in the mind of a B2B buyer. And you know they have people in firms who are called buyers. What about no. real estate agents? Would they be considered B to B or B to C, or could they be both? Would point? real estate agents be B to B or B to C? Most start B to C and they sell houses. Now you can make the the, the change, but but still, it is a different model selling to a couple than preparing a presentation for a company who wants to buy real estate for a McDonald's. Completely different model. Now, can you do it? Yes, it is painful. Now you're a B2B buyer and there are people in companies called buyers. A 
buyer is trained for how to handle salespeople. So a new task buy is hard as hell because they're already satisfied, right? They have realized needs that are being met. They don't understand what your company's products and services can do. So they're like this. And the buyer goes, another salesperson, sit down. You got five minutes. This new task buy is really hard. Once you've succeeded there, and your product or your service has accepted, then the next buy is called a straight rebuy. Is this hard? No. Because you've already changed. They've kicked out their existing supplier and you're in. Or you, you're in some area that they've never had before. And the accounting system understands you, and they've created all the processes, and they, then their trucks can get in. Everything is, is greased. Is that when you can smile and light up a stogie? No. But this is what lots of salespeople do. They think that they've arrived, when in fact you've just started. Because companies change. Product lines change. Consumer demand changes. And so your product or service could be kicked out. So you've got to stay eyeball to eyeball with the buyer. You can never take anything for granted. And then, from nowhere, comes a modified rebuy. Home Depot is known for the modified re rebuy. That means you have been working, you sell cleaning equipment, for rugs, and you've been working for two years to get your cleaning supplies and your machine in there. Finally, Home Depot agrees. Taking you two years in that buying center to get to everybody, and finally they kick the existing vendor out, and you're in. And so then once you get nice and comfortable, and the people are buying your cleaning supplies, and the commission checks are coming in, you show up at Home Depot, say, how are things going? And the buyer says, we need to talk. About what? I've just gotten this order from the president. He wants everyone to cut their price by 10%. Should cut your price by 10%. Now, margins at this level are thin. What do you do? cave in, it could be half of your commission is gone. So selling here is critical. Example, years ago, I went out to Fruit of the Loom and talked to the, the, the I think he was the national sales manager. I was interested in bringing him in to speak to classes. He was interested. So when I talked to him about their selling model, he said, relationships are bunk. They don't matter. Well, of course I don't disagree with him, because I've been taught you don't disagree with the perception of a buyer. So I said, really? Help me understand. He said, listen, Walmart will cut you off for a penny. You do not get the Walmart deal. You've got to cut your price and you have to equip your salespeople to be hard and negotiate hard. I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe there's a model here I don't understand. So I said, you mean there's nothing else you can do but price? And he said, well, he said, you know, every now and then you get lucky. And I said, well, how would you do that? He said, well, we were at Walmart once and they wanted us to cut the price. And when we walked into their stores, we realized that they weren't using the end caps for our children's underwear. And that women would, when they're pushing their carts, if it's on an end cap, and, and their kids need underwear, that they'll just pick off a couple as they're going up to the register. They don't cost very much. And, and so it's, when they tried that, their, their volume increased. And they came back to us and said, you don't have to raise your price. 
Now, I didn't say, see, I told you. But that was the truth. He just, he disproved the idea that price was the thing that mattered the most. So when you're dealing with the modified rebuy, you have to be incredibly consultative and you have to understand what's going on in the mind of that buyer. Now, how would you do the 10% thing? So in the Home Depot example, how would you handle that? Well, you have to say 10%. Wow, are you thinking, what's happening to this guy? And when he told, when he says to you, I got this letter, I, ha I have to get a 10% reduction from everybody, how's he feel? Well, he's got a job to do, you know, and it's not about you, it's about the letter. So most people would go, geez, Bob, and we've been doing business for 30 years, and, you know, I, I guess we'll cut our price, and then you get back and you get blistered because you didn't defend the price. You've got to say, Bob, I know you're in a really tight spot. So, Let's talk a little bit about what's going on. And let me see if I can think about some way that we can achieve your goal. What Home Depot wants. Would that be okay? Yeah, that's what we want, that's okay. So once you understand what's in the mind of the buyer, and you ask what you said, the last time when I came in, you were talking about the issue of how you want to get more sales at the register. And if, you'll, if you would reconfigure and put our product here, we've done this with this one and this one and this one, it'll increase your sales by about 10%. And that would take care of the 10%. Oh. Let me try it. And then maybe you're in. But this is where you've got to get inside the mind of the buyer. Now, in your text, the author goes through the alignment of what the buyer is thinking versus what you are thinking. And you must align to the buyer. Let's walk through. What's the buyer thinking about when he has a realized need? He's aware of that need. Or in your conversation with him, he's aware of an unrealized need. Then the second thing he does is he evaluates solutions. If it's, if it's realized, he's on the internet, and remember, 56% of the decision the companies make in buying a new product or service are finished, are completed by the time the first salesman gets a shot. So they're going to evaluate solutions, and then they're going to figure out the extent to which that would resolve the problem. They're going to make a purchase, and then they're going to implement. That's what's in the mind of the buyer. Now, this, the model that I learned that's simpler, it's the same model, it's called AIDA. After the famous old Italian opera, it stands for awareness or attention, interest, desire, action. Same model, works B to B, works B to C. First, you have to get their attention. How do you get their attention? You've got to build trust. All right, now we're going to, again, we're going to align here. So this is what the buyer's thinking of. Now you have a consultant process. So generically, this is what the salesperson's thinking. First, identify needs. Second, once you've identified the need, then you want to select the product or service that will fulfill the need. You have a conversation with the buyer and you determine whether or not the need can be satisfied and then you execute and you provide the service. Now, what should your presentation be? Given that you understand it's in the mind of the buyer and what your typical process is, how do you present? This is the model Brian Tracy taught me years ago. The approach. You gotta build trust. Second, you have to identify needs. To the extent that you've built sufficient trust, then the buyer is gonna be more truthful to answer your questions. When you've done that, then you make your presentation. You may have to negotiate the price, and then you close or you, con or you confirm. 
and then you have to install the product. So this is the alignment between the buyer and you, the salesperson. Now what areas of questions can you ask? Or is the buyer? Is the buyer thinking about that you must address? Once. So the buyer is thinking. Do I have to make a decision? How urgent is it for me to make this decision? So you're presenting all these ideas, and what's the buyer thinking? He's only thinking about him, not you. In lots of companies, there are issues going on inside that you have no knowledge of. Politics. What if your current supplier, the salesperson for your current supplier, is the son of the controller? And he was hired by this company because of that relationship, and you're trying to kick him out. Would it be helpful to know that? Yeah, how are you going to know it? But you've got to build a relationship with someone and learn about the person. Then you've got to get on LinkedIn and find the person. And you look at the same name, you go, oh, not a Meyer. Controllers are not a Meyer. Oh, hmm. You have a new question to ask. Are these people related? Now, do you not go in if, they, if those two are related? You stop your selling? No, because listen, if that's how you got the account, the chances you can win it are even better. Next, has the money been budgeted? If there's no money in the budget and you're selling B2B, they're not going to buy this year. And last, who's the user? So if you don't get a conversation with the user, which sometimes is really hard, what if you're selling for Crown lift trucks? And you're selling not only lift trucks that move heavy things, but you're selling a service in which they would lease all the lift trucks from you, and you would just be in charge of making sure that they got certain things from one area to certain things in another. Who are you going to talk to? The president? If you want to find out what's going on, you don't go in the front door, you've got to go in the back door. And you've got to have your jeans on and your polo shirt, and you've got to talk to the head of logistics who's going to tell you that the lift trucks they've got are breaking down, and they get flat tires. And then you can take that information, then you can walk in the front door with that knowledge, and then you might have a shot. Now let's talk about the difference between transactional and consultative. I'm going beyond the chapter here. Hmm? I'm just telling you, I'm going to go beyond this because to me this is academic of whether you're going to go transactional or consultative. Now it's, it's helpful to understand the transactional buyer. But you are going to operate as a consultative salesperson until I'm hoarse, because that's how you can succeed. Transactional buyers. So, transactional buyer. What are things about the transactional buyer? Well, if you're not careful, if someone says, uh, and again, if you're in retail, Mr. Upton, the person comes in and says, I need a rod and reel to a blunt, blunt rod and reel that fits on a rod or this one, and I need this kind of, of fishing line because we're going north, and you say, so how long do you have that rod? Hey, I just need a reel. Can you go get me a reel? Well, I just wanted to make sure you know that I'm getting the right thing for you. Did you not hear what I said? I'm being a high D, but you got to make sure that you respond to the needs of the transactional buyer. Now, maybe you can slip in a little bit so you can maybe sell them something else. But be careful because they've done their homework on transactional. But here is the consultative buyer. Uh, 
a consultative buyer is one who knows they have realized needs, but they may be open to you. So what's the difference? Let's take a look. Consultative versus transactional. Transactional salesperson. One, the emphasis is on features. Consultative is on benefits, value. On a transactional, in a, in a transactional situation, the emphasis is on price, and availability. What is it for consultative? It's value. It's value versus price. How is value determined in a transactional situation? It's by the product. Remember last time we talked about that. That value can come from the product, the company, or from you. So the product and the company are Things in a transactional sale that are important. How about consultative? It's you. It's the salesperson that brings the value. In transactional, the salesperson matters less. Why can't you find people to wait on you at Walmart? Because it's transactional. They, don't, they can't afford to have the Uptons around to help them. Only when you have sufficient margin where the salesperson can define the value and explain the benefit. Relationships and transactional tend to be win-lose, lose-win. What's lose-win? means the person says, so that's $29.95. I'll give you $25. Yeah, the price is $29.95. Price driven and availability. And lose win means hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, let me talk to the manager. Let me see if I can get you 25 bucks. You back to the manager, the manager just blisters you. Why didn't you defend the price? Oh, we can't sell forever. And you go back in and oh, crap, I can't do it. <laughs> That's transaction. But can you be consultative in that situation? Absolutely. So it's kind of like a pawn shop? Pawn shop? Yeah, whenever you go into a pawn shop, they always try to bargain your item less than what it. Well, now you know you can't really bargain on retail. Sometimes you can't, but you try, right? Can I get a discount when I go to Taco Bell? They have a senior citizens discount. I always get my discount. So what if it's only eleven cents? It make a difference. 11 cents in my change box, right in the car, and the next time I need a penny, I've got one right there. Wendy's does too, they give you a free drink. Thank you. <laughs> does price matter? Well, yeah. All right. So relationships are win-lose. Consultative, win-win. Why? Because you are, you're going to continue to think about how to deliver a win to the company and as a result, you get paid full commission too. That's why. Commissions are low in B2C, in transactional. Commissions are high on the consultative side. This is how you're going to make good money. Now, the transactional side produces quotes. Easy to produce a quote. On the consultative side, we produce proposals. And proposals have embedded in them the value that you will provide. Transactional, you sell more by working harder. And consultative, you sell more by working more smarter. Got it. Transactional is tactical and efficient and expedient. Consultative is strategic and long term. Okay. Now, so I've differentiated now the transactional buyer and the consultative buyer. Now, what questions must you be willing to ask that aligns 
with what the buyer's thinking? You gotta ask. In fact, these are the questions that the buyer is going to ask that you must be prepared. One, why should I buy from you? Why should I buy from you? Second, what should I buy from you? Third, where should I buy it? So why's first? Okay, you answer why. Okay, so what? What's going to fulfill the need? And then, can I just say thank you very much and buy it online? Or have you created sufficient value as a salesperson that the person recognizes you should get paid? What's a fair price? Once they figure out why, what, and where, then how do I know I'm going to get a good deal? And last is, should I buy it now? Urgency. Last, we talked about subject need, idea, benefit. The whole process of individualizing a presentation and how you can do it. There are other models that help you understand what the buyer is thinking about. The first one is Maslow's hierarchy. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This is an excellent model that helps you understand where the customer is, and how can you determine this? By the questions that the buyer asks you. So Maslow's hierarchy, hierarchy says, the first level of needs that need to be satisfied are physiological. Those are food and water, air, coming. Shelter is probably safety. It's it, physiological and and then once you 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 have air to breathe and water to drink and food to eat once those physiological needs are fulfilled then shelter emerges and safety once those needs are satisfied only then will affiliation and belonging emerge once those are satisfied then esteem for the person and last, self-actualization, where people are, are buying, are, are wanting to fulfill themselves in their highest and best use. Valuable. Last. How can you tell about someone based upon the groups that they are engaged in? So the first one is roles. What roles do they play? What are different roles? I roll in a family. What else? Mr. Dalkus? A business. Business owner. Role. Employee. Employee. Well, it's coming. We're just talking about roles right now, roles I play. So I'm a homeowner, I'm a provider, I'm a father, I'm a husband. Those roles are all different. And so when people are, when they come into your business, or, or you're, you're engaged with them, understanding, going on LinkedIn and figuring out what their roles are is helpful in helping you understand them. Second, reference groups. How many of you are members of a fraternity or sorority? Reference group. So if I know you're a blum, 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 and, and then I know that your values are this, then I can infer that this is going to be important to you. Social class, more important in England than it is here. But social class is an issue. And last, culture. Understanding the difference between our culture in the United States versus Japanese, versus French, and how people operate in those cultures. So today, our subject began with how to help you become more persuasive. How then to systematize, it's not about you, it's about them. 
So we've talked over and over about how to understand buyers so that different people you make presentations to differently that make sense to them. When you put this into operation, you'll be more in control. You'll build better relationships. And Mr. Lawson, make more money. All right, guys, looking forward to team three on Wednesday. See you then.